Welcome, Internet. It's so good to be back online. I'm Toy Thomas, and I have a wonderful author to introduce to you today. Um, she is an author. She is a narrator. She is a virtual assistant and a self-proclaimed dreamer, and I'm so excited to share her with you today. Everyone, this is Karina Kentness. I think I said that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Karina Cantas. <laughs> All right, so Karina is here to talk about her writing, um, her many publications, but um, I know that I've just recently read one of her books and I want to dive into a bunch of questions, but before we do that, let's have her tell you a little bit about herself. Okay, um, I'm from the UK, Midlands UK. I'm uh, living in Greece, uh, Corfu, the island of Corfu for most of my life now. Um, it was while I was in Corfu over the early years that I decided to take my writing more seriously and try to become published. Um, since then, I won't say how many years ago that was, uh, since then it's um, eight books, uh, around about 30 other publications, freelance, um, writing, um, reviews, band reviews, um, what else have I done, poetry, even poetry. Um, and I'm also, as uh, Toy said, I'm also um, helping authors with um, getting their name and their books out there with uh, promotion and marketing. Um, I design book trailers. I uh, make um, teasers and banners, and I do all sorts. And uh, you know, I do, I do as much as I can to help people, uh, to help myself, of course, as well. Um, I love writing. Um, I haven't picked up a pen for a little while, so hopefully um, I'll get back into that one day. But uh, eight books, and I'm, I'm really proud of that. Wow, that is quite an accomplishment. I mean, I obviously, after reading your book, I did some research. I knew a little bit about you, but I didn't realize you were such a Renaissance woman. So <laughs> um, I definitely want to talk to you some more about that. But I wanted to go ahead and jump into Illusional Reality. Um, this is a fantasy story where someone, uh, I won't give too much away because we'll talk about it, but you have this character who kind of ends up going into another world and realizing that the life that she had isn't really her life. Am, am I getting close? Yeah, I mean, she basically, she finds out that her life in, let's say, just let's call it England, um, because it's a totally different dimension to Sinia, but uh, she finds out that everything was a lie, that she were, she knew that she was adopted, um, but she didn't know who her real parents were until she stepped foot into Sinia's soil, and then she learns who she really is, and her world just comes crashing in around her, you know, that everything that she knew was a lie, everything that she thought was her life was taken away from her, and she just felt so alone and like she had nothing to especially with what happened in Decilia as soon as she lands on the the place what they say to her I mean that makes her even more you know this isn't no this isn't right you know I don't agree with this I don't believe it I'm not going to believe it uh, take me back to where I came you know <laughs> you can't do this to me but uh, yeah so it's just, yeah so she goes from our normal life a normal a woman, hard-working uh, businesswoman, um, single, not looking for anyone, um, working all the hours she can at the office because she knows she's got nothing back home to go home for. So it's just everything just goes totally inwards once she arrives in Tissinia. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, um, the story, I mean, we start out and we have Becky and then Becky kind of gets whisked through this portal and then she shows up in this new land and she's now Thaya, is that correct? Thaya. Thaya, okay. Well, I mean, once I started, you know, reading the book, and, you know, I looked at the cover of the book and obviously the cover is like perfectly fitting for the story. Because when I first saw the cover, I was like, what's going on there, you know? <laughs> but the cover fits perfectly with the stories, you know, the background, and you see kind of her duality. But yeah. I have to say that the title kind of threw me off a little bit, even after reading it. What exactly is illusional reality? Well, it's 
her reality is is in is in England. It's uh, working in a, a marketing firm and going home and having a, a frozen meal and uh, seeing her cat. You know, that's her reality. So suddenly being taken from that and thrown into a totally new place, a magical place, and being told that she has to do this and that she's expected to do this and they've, that they've prophesied her arrival for the last how long. It's like it's an illusion. It's like it, she's dreaming. Yeah. And, you know, she's not going to um, suddenly say, oh, right, okay, so here I am and this is real. Because if you put yourself in that position, just for a second, would you believe it? No, you're right. You think you were dreaming. You think you were in um, Lord of the Rings or something. You know, yeah. you're, you're the, one of the main princesses in Lord of the Rings. And so that's what she thinks it is. But then, of course, once she enters the plecky and she's told and she understands who she is and what's expected of her and all of her background and she basically knows who her mum and father are and, and they talk to her and everything, um, then that world suddenly becomes a reality wow. and her other world was an illusion. Exactly. Wow. I didn't, I mean hearing it from you it makes perfect sense I just kind of missed that a little bit but um another thing that really kind of got me about the story was I mean obviously she you know she's in this magical world so things are not going to be how they are in what we consider normal you know re reality like the um scions they live in trees and I, I was like why do they live in the trees I mean why do they live in trees? I mean they have these powers and things like that but I like I'm like they don't have wings why do they live in trees so that's, I okay, guess that's my so question. Why would you want to live in a tree house? What would your reason, if you if you had to, or if you wanted to, if you could, what would your reason be for it? Um, I think for me, I mean, I'm gonna be honest, I kind of want to live in a tree house. I mean, but it, it's kind of me, you know, having the, the, my inner child just having fun at play and being able to live in something close to magic. So I guess if you're living in a magical world, You'd live in a tree. <laughs> also, I mean, you know that um, the Changlings, the sacred stones, mm -hmm. is are the elements. Right. And so the Ticinians are always close to nature and the elements. And so to actually live within the trees brings them one step closer to nature. Um, that's one of the reasons. Um, also, I think when you're up above, you sort of less chance of having any dangers as you would on the ground that's right because you can see it coming because you have that vantage point they are the, these people are kind of living in fear you know of this other group of people who might you know come and invade them at any point so i mean that that's a good point um i can't remember what uh darthorn is their ruler and what are they called again they're called the saints the, the saints so um what what kind i would I don't remember exactly, but what type of dwelling do they live in? The Saints. Um, they live in like um, clay dome houses. Right. Um, very simple, apart from, of course, Darthorn's abode, which is like huge and looking down on everyone, including Tassinia, but he actually looks down on his people as well. It shows his wealth, it shows who he is, that he is the warlord. Um, but the people, it's when Saya, when Saya actually goes into the city, she's so surprised with how well the people look and how happy they are. With everything she's heard about Darthorn and what he and his son have done, she just expects all of the evil, but maybe um, because they have, they're not being well treated by their warlord uh, uh, Darthorn, that, um, you know, head down and horrible dirty clothes and that's what she expected right. so she was really surprised when she met them because i mean they they are very happy um people that get on with whatever they have to do and don't really get involved with the power struggle between Darthorn with uh, getting the stones and controlling Tissinia. they don't want to know anything they just want to get on with you know their lives right. So they live in, in dome-shaped uh, clay kind of houses. And then Darthorn, again, is in a dome shape, which is, um, it's actually dome, one of the most safest 
um, structures uh, from wind, from earthquakes. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one of the reasons why I chose that shape for him. Also, you don't know what's going on inside. You know when you have a castle and you see all the windows and the turrets and, you know, you sort of get a glimpse of what... But with Darthorn, the only way you can see in is if you saw his huge window that went around half of the dome which is where, of course, Fire meets him for the first time. But he's so high up that nobody can even see into that window. Right. And yet he can see everything. Okay, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, I, I, as soon as you mentioned, I remembered, you know, about, you know, how the how they live. But what you said about, you know, Dawthorne's dome castle kind of made sense because I remember when I was reading it. And then, of course, you know, as the story goes on, I find out about the dark magic. I was like, that's probably are you know helping to conceal that and hold that in and so no that, one knows what goes on exactly in that like dome. <laughs> even when i got no to one, that part no one gets <laughs> invited you know to go in there's no um oh let's have open house and let's um you know invite people in for dinner it's not it's just yeah that's no one knows what goes on in there so that's one of the reasons why i picked that shape okay so now getting back to the magic um now the cyan i keep saying that wrong i know <laughs> but their magic comes from the stones um and i guess what i'm trying to figure out is i know that once thai gets there she you know kind of figures out how to harness the power but the other individuals also have some power of their own and i guess i'm wanting to understand a little bit more of how they're tapping into that power and how they're actually using it well, I can't go into too much details about the actual, what's going on with the stones, because that sort of clarifies in book two. Okay. Okay, I know you're happy there's a book two, aren't you? I, I am, because when I now. finish reading it, I'm like, there better be a book two, because if not, I'm upset. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't, you know, I haven't officially said there's a book two, but yes, there is, and it's already written, so okay. one day it will come out. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so... I can't really go into much about them, but um, not all of the uh, Ticinians have any gifts. Um, whereas, uh, again, only the warlords and um, the rulers of Saints will have any power. But there is, um, it's generations. If one generation, say the Gantis, which is the rulers of Ticinia, um, everyone who is a Ganti from there on will have that same gift which for Saya, it's being able to move things with her mind. With um, her, her teacher, I forget, he was... Um, Alcazar, yeah, yeah, Alcazar doesn't have any gifts. But he um, teaches the people who do have the gifts. He teaches people who, who do have gifts, yeah. I'm not saying that Alcazar never had any gifts, but I'm saying in the book he doesn't have any. Okay. Then there's... Um, I think it's, uh, you have to excuse me if I get the names wrong, um, Salkar, who has the ability of uh, sonic hearing. So all of him from his generation would have that ability. And so it, it goes down the line and um, nobody's missed. Whether or not they're as powerful as the last person, that all depends on the teacher, <laughs> like Alcazar. So he, he has a good job. Saya, because they're actually taught as soon as they're basically two birthdays old in Ticinia. They started to, to learn how to control their uh, gifts. Um, Saya, of course, has had all those years in, uh, in uh, England and uh, she doesn't know how to, in, how, to, um, how to project it out, how to control it. Right. Um, she doesn't know anything about all that. And so that makes sort of Alcazar's job a little bit harder or so he thinks. Um, and there's uh, a lot of surprises when people realise how quickly she is picking things up. And little things show further on through the book that uh, fire is a lot more than what they thought. Yeah, I, I remember reading that part of the story. Um, she was kind of a unexpected quick learner so i thought i liked that part of the story because you're like what wait she did that already you know but i'm not going to give anything away 
So. Exactly. There is a reason for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so speaking of her kind of her character, specifically Thaya, there were a couple of times when reading the story where I kind of felt like she was a bit of a hothead. And that's coming from personal experience because I can be a bit of a hothead myself. So I was just wondering if there was a specific reason that was part of her character or if maybe she was molded after someone. Um, you know, just because, I mean, don't get me wrong, she's placed in like this impossible scenario. So I would be a little upset too, but it does seem like there's just a few times where she just kind of is unnecessary she is she's very um she's very stubborn for a start and she's very in, in, insistive uh on what she wants and the way she has to have it done um and even towards the end of the book where people are saying well how do you know this and she's like well i just know by then of course she she does have that ability to um to be able to um say that but uh with with Thaya, she's I just try to think of how I would behave if I was in her shoes. So maybe it's me being uh, hot-headed and uh, stubborn. Um, but I try to think of how people would react in the same position. You know, it's not just that you've been thrown into this very strange place, very scary place. She's now been told about this prophecy and been ordered that she has to, without going into right, any more yeah. details, she has to do this. Of course, she's going to turn around and say, uh uh, I don't think so. Right. <laughs> you know, so there is a few times, um, there is a few times through the book where she does, she does uh, get still a little bit selfish, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand where that's coming from. And it's not until she really, really accepts the situation and knows that she can control the situation. And that's when she finally says, yes, this is my fight and I'm going to finish this. Yeah, I, I definitely feel like, felt more sorry for her kind of towards the end, just because I knew that she was trying to do the right thing. Whereas kind of before that, I was kind of like with her, I was kind of like, oh, forget these people. But then, you know, once she starts to really embrace it, you're kind of with her embracing it. And you're just like, oh man, you know? But I thought that was a really, you know, cool like topic. She never gets a break, does she? No, no, no. I mean, she, never, that, she never gets a break. And just that's one of the start, reasons why you know. there has to be a book, too, because <laughs> I won't go into that, but you know. No, I mean, you think everything's going so well for her. I believe she accepted things. And, I mean, she just gets pie thrown in her face every, <laughs> every step she turns. But, yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah there are a few... Um, I don't know if you picked up on them, but there are um, some very subtle hints of something um, not so good going on with Saya. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, you will learn more about that in uh, book two. All questions will be answered. Okay. So my next question is, is I kind of know, like when I was reading the story, you know, having that perspective, you know, every reader picks up on something different. I feel like my favorite part of the story was her developing that friendship you know with her um handmaid i can't remember her name right now um oh, yes no. yes i loved their friendship and i won't give anything away for everyone but that was, was my you know it was special it was special to both of them because she didn't feel like she had a friend in the whole place exactly. i mean she had outside but he was, he wasn't, <clears throat> you can't have girly chats with a guy, you know, so exactly. they really connected, and then she was so shy, Kezar, mm -hmm. and it was fire that brought Kezar out of her shell, right. and she blossomed, you know, and it's like when fire says, you know, you're at the age now, I'm going to find you, I'm, you know, I'm going to make sure that you find a, a, a suitable um, man to marry. Right. Um, but yeah, that was a really special relationship between those two. So I guess my question is, is that I know that that relationship was probably like my favorite part of the book. Now, as you know, the writer, the creator of all this, was there any particular part that you favored more than another? It's like um, I, I just had to do a, a best bits of this book to send to a, a website. And I was like, well, how do you pick your favorite so I picked my favorite three scenes and the first one was at the 
the um, festival where her and Alcazar were flirting. Mm -hmm. Now that banter, and um, you could feel the, the heat coming off of those two right. without anything happening, with just words, you know, with words and looks. And so, so I really enjoyed playing around with that. Um, then there was um, Kovon's first meeting, or Thaya's first meeting with Kovon. And for people who don't know who he is, he is the uh, Darthorn's son, mm -hmm. um, who will end up taking over and becoming Warlord. Um, that was, uh, I wanted it to be like, um, like a play act, you know? It's like, oh yeah, I'm so happy to meet you. And oh yes, hello Kovon, yes, how, nice to meet you too. But of course, you know, it's like, you know what Thai is like, she's so stubborn and mm -hmm. she's so, she's like, I'll just cut the crap, you know, I know what you're after and it's not, you know, so you can stop pretending. Yeah. But it's like when, when, um, when he smiles so sickly at Thai the first time and she can see through that smile and because it's not returned, then you see yeah. the real face of Kovon. Exactly. So yeah, I really enjoyed that scene. Um, and what was the other scene I enjoyed? Oh yes, where um, Kovon tries to uh, control Fire when she goes to meet him one last time. Oh yeah, I remember that and scene. <laughs> that was that was intense. That uh -huh. was really intense. That yeah, I um I wanted her to be fighting him, but I also wanted her to because his will was trying to over overthrow her own that she was like oh well maybe maybe I should be with him you know maybe uh, I will have a better life with him because that's what he was portraying to her mind right. and so she had to think that she really had to 100% think that but then of course she's so much more powerful than that now that it broke through and she saw the falsehood and that's where she just went <laughs> say no more <laughs> right all right so i have one more question i i have i have lots more questions but i feel like if i ask them i'll probably be spoiling something for the second book because i just i mean i this is this was a story that kind of crept up on me i didn't you know devour it all at once but it was like once i got to the end i was like what you know so i guess my question is, is will we get to you know see kind of more of the other side of Thaya, will, will any of that affect her in this new world? I mean, that you were saying about the duality in, in book one is a Sire and Becky. And there are, like I say, subtle hints that something is going on and that there is going to be a fight between light and dark. All, the, all your uh, questions will be answered in book two, but I will say that there is another duality towards Thaya. Oh. And it's not of her own making. It's something that she has to accept and to learn how to control. And uh, so this is a second duality that comes out in book two. All right, I, I won't press too much. I'll just have to, you know, <laughs> wait for it to come out and read it. But uh, I, I got to say, you know, Illusion or Reality, like I said, it was definitely one of those stories that just kind of caught me off guard. I think I went in reading and thinking I knew, but I really didn't know. So that's I, I, and that's said, good. Yeah. That's good. That is good, yeah. So, um, but I want to just ask you, I mean, that's just one of the books that you've written. What are some, tell me some of the other things did you write? Do you write in multiple genres or you just kind of stick to fantasy? Yeah, I mean, I write in every, nearly every genre. Um, I started I actually did my first novel. I was writing a lot of flash fiction. And that's like, um, for people that don't know, it's like five minute fiction. It's like one page of a story, start, middle and end. And so after many years of doing that, I had enough to make my own collections of my short stories. They were already previously published online and in uh, print in magazines and stuff. Um, but then I put my own collection together and that's called Heads and Tales. Um, the second collection is called Undressed, which sort of, I call it Undressed. People look at the cover and think, of, and look at the word and think it's a, erotica or something, <laughs> but it's not. It's just about me undressing myself 
and being more naked and open to the fans and letting myself, my, my past and my own experiences to actually come out in my writing in that book. So I'm more, I'm more open and naked um, in uh, Undress. But though they're to my uh, collections, I have a young adult supernatural thriller called Stone Cold, mm. which is again very biographical and it has a lot to do with what I went through at school when I, I was bullied through most of my schooling. And um, so that comes out. It's a lot of um, basically things that happen to teenagers, whether it's bullying, whether it's depression, whatever. It's all in that book. So, um, but it's entertaining because it's a supernatural thriller, okay. and um, they go. Uh, it's all um, taking place in Scotland in an archaeological dig, which she volunteered with a lot of other students to help out with, and then people start dying one by one, a mysterious and gruesome deaths, and no one knows who it is, what's happened, what's going on. So this is a little novella, but it's um, most of, except for the supernatural elements and the gruesome murders, most of it is actually from my own experience, so that's quite biographical. Um, the first novel I ever wrote was in times of violence, which I wrote after reading um, Essie Hinton's The Outsiders. She is my favourite author of all time. They are my favourite books, all of them. Uh, Rumblefish, uh, that was then, this yeah. is now. I don't know if you've read them all. Absolutely amazing. I've only so read I wrote In Times of Violence after reading and, of course, watching the film mm -hmm. The Outsiders. I have a story to tell. I wanted to um, bring outsiders into the 20th century, should I say. Um, but it's, I mean, it's not to do with anything from that book. It's just basically the only similarity is that these, these um, teenagers, um, these uh, kids, they just never felt like they belonged anywhere. They always felt like outcasts. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the family unity. Um, they didn't. And so, so they rebelled. They rebelled against authority and they rebelled against... Uh, they, they were no good. They left her, dropped out of school. Um, they got into trouble, and the older they were getting, the more trouble they were getting into. Now it wasn't just uh, uh, pickpocketing and what have you. But they were getting into, you know, some. Anyway, so so <laughs> this is about um, Jade, who's a very sheltered teenager, and uh, she goes to stay with her aunt in London, and that's when she meets the tyrants, and she sees the respect that they have and the love that they have for one another and she can only wish to have that feeling because she's another one who always felt like an outcast, she had a drunken mother, a father who didn't care about her, always felt alone and all of a sudden she had a chance of being loved, respected and in her first ever family and so she jumps at the chance of uh, being part of their group and uh, but nothing's as easy as uh, you want it to be so anyway yeah uh, in times of violence is my first one uh, then uh, huntress was the sequel to in times of violence but it's also a standalone book so you don't have to read the first one okay. uh, lawless justice that was my third and then the fourth one road rage they start off in times of violence as a young adult it has some uh, sexual content it has some violence but it's not explicit and the further down you go, the more darker right. it gets. Um, the series is called uh, The Outlaws. Um, they're all romances, um, but um, they're not erotica like all the other MC uh, books that are out there at the moment. This is pure thriller. Um, I was never actually in a motorcycle club, but I was always surrounded by them. Okay. within from when I was a young age right until I've always been um, into the lifestyle I've always uh, loved riding motorbikes and uh, singing and I used to sing in a band rock songs and what have you so I've That's always cool. had that passion and so although although it's an entertaining book there is a lot of truth in these uh, these stories so, um, yeah, so that's the series and that's uh, The Outlaw. And all eight of my books can all be found on Amazon. Wow, that sounds incredible. I mean, 
just, I mean. It's a bit different from the fantasy, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I, was I wasn't expecting when, when you started telling me about some of your other work because your fantasy just seems to come so naturally. But I mean, hey, you got talent, so use it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, that sounds really great. I just wanted to ask you, you know, one more question. Obviously, you've got, you know, an extensive you know, a career, a library of work. Um, are you a self-published, traditionally published, or do you consider yourself a hybrid author? I started off um, self-published. Um, I had so many rejections for in times of violence from the agents and publishers. You've got to remember, we're going back 20 plus years. Uh, Ebooks weren't invented, you know. Everyone was crying out and panning for the, you know, to get an agent because the only way you can get published by the top five. So it was all paperbacks and you had um, many, unfortunately, you had many people that were taking advantage of authors um, because they wanted to um, be published so desperately they didn't see what was clearly in front of them. Um, I got burned twice very badly by two different companies. But this was before before ebooks, before everyone suddenly became a writer. Right. And everyone can just go out like that and write a book, you know. It was uh, it was a lot a lot different back then. Um, so and then I had a contract for Huntress. Um, but unfortunately it was a small press and although they did everything that they said they were going to do they didn't have the funds to do the marketing and promoting yeah. well as i was doing the marketing and promoting for my other books i thought why am i giving you a percentage when i can do it myself right. and so after a year I, I took it back i've been an indie author independent author ever since and i'm very proud to be one and i shall continue to be an independent author go indie <laughs> go indie <laughs> Okay. Well, I mean, I, this has been a wonderful conversation. I'm so glad I got to speak to you. I mean, after reading the book and, you know, just, it's always good to get the author's perspective, just, you know, as an author myself, but as the reader, because sometimes there's little tidbits and insights that, you know, can op be opened up just by, you know, having that conversation. And I'm lucky that I've been able to speak with you. Oh, and thank you. Thank you so much. And it's been awesome. Thank you, Toy. All right. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all we have time for today. And um, see you next time. Bye. <laughs>